So this is a presentation for uh, Thin's basic concepts. And uh, right now, the uh, Thin's version is version 1.1. And uh, I'm going to describe uh, basically the, well, the basic model, including an uh, overview of the function and data types. Um, I'm going to go through some of the operations, what business need the objects and the related types are, profiles, responses, faults, uh, things like the service model, uh, all the things that are necessary to understand the, uh, what, what FIMS is getting at and, and uh, how to approach it. So, let's try this again. So what are the considerations for both the implementer and the user? And this is aimed at software developers. Um, and on both sides, uh, the, the common part is explanation of the PIMS operational mechanisms. And this is basically how PIMS works. Um, for each side, it's what does it mean to implement PIMS from your point of view? For a developer, what's it mean to implement a PIMS service? And what's a, from a user? How do you use a FIMS service? And uh, this is most important when you uh, understand, especially around uh, how the uh, service model works and uh, what the responsibilities are from the caller side and from the service side. So let's start off with a basic uh, look at FIMS. Um, what is it, really? What, what's what's the, the general concept here? And uh, what the, uh, the FIMS model is trying to provide is a service-oriented architecture for media. And before uh, the service-oriented architecture world, uh, distributed and complex systems were generally tightly coupled, which means that code uh, would that needed to call another function would hardwire the mechanism for talking to that other function directly. And then that service would then call another service, and that would be hard-coded, so to speak. And so what you get is a tightly coupled system where you couldn't easily replace any of the components because that means going into the software and changing uh, the encoding uh, and adapting to any changes that that, uh, that included. The, the main goal of service-oriented architecture is something called decoupling. And that means that you have uh, an isolation layer, an interface, between the user of a function and the provider of a function. Now these interfaces uh, are generally, uh, should be implemented in a sort of fundamental or common way so that um, a wide variety of services can supply the implementation for that interface uh, and have it map the interface uh, types to its own types and that the users can get work done with it. Uh, an interface is no good if it doesn't do what the clients need to do. So uh, a lot of work has gone into develop the FIMS interface as an abstraction, as an isolation layer, to try to provide a, a good uh, mix of uh, commonality and usability. To go over that is, is in detail, uh, we mentioned the good coupling of the implementations uh, listed here from orchestration. Typically in large systems, there is uh, some sort of what we call an orchestration level. It could be a business process orchestration system, but it could also be a, a lightweight uh, client software uh, which uses messages passing back and forth. It, it really doesn't matter what the client side is. Uh, the important part is when a function is needed, that there's a, uh, a standard interface that can be used by the calling software. Um, and regardless of the implementation that's behind it, uh, the work will get done in, in a standard way. Uh, so that means that we have to use these interoperable types that can work across uh, lots of different solutions. We also have to be able to allow for extensions because sometimes uh, you want to be able to uh, extend your, your solution. A provider may offer uh, some additional information uh, and that information can be tested so that when a client code calls uh, a function and gets data back, you can look and see if the extensions are there and then use them. Uh, we also want to be able to announce our capabilities dynamically so that client code can handle the different implementations. In other words, uh, if you know by asking a service, hey, can you, can you support this kind of query, um, you can know right away whether or not it's worth uh, implementing or sending that to the service. And so you can make decisions about what you can and can't do uh, based on what the service is telling you um, 
instead of having to try it and fail, which can be a little bit more complicated. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we try to keep it simple, try to handle uh, sort of the, the, the most common, the most popular, and universally accepted formats and workflows. So if we want to look at the abstract model, uh, you have the client process layer. As I mentioned, it could be uh, anything from a enterprise uh, orchestration business process system to uh, a single small application, it doesn't matter. Um, the core message is here is that you have a media bus, which means you can take an object, put it on the bus, get it back out, put it back on the bus, uh, and it gets delivered to the uh, appropriate system. Um, the common elements of that, that that are very useful to know is that you have the ability for asynchronous communication, which means that you can start up a job that will take a while, and your process isn't blocked waiting for that to finish. Uh, and also you have these objects uh, that communicate data um, so that you can uh, carry your information. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that as we go. And these uh, these will be discussed. Um, you have an abstract service layer which provides you those uh, interfaces that are universal uh, to all implementations. And then you have a specific implementation layer. And this is where the software uh, executes those functions that you uh, you've asked for. And so that there's a, a mapping in the system between the interface and the implementation. Those get bound to URLs, and uh, the services are now able to be called. Um, so the, the core of this is that we have some uh, concepts that are shared across all the operations, um, primarily uh, on, the, on the service, on say the transform, transfer, and uh, capture, which are like activity-oriented. Um, those are business media objects and profiles. Um, those are can be uh, shared between the different services um, and, and provide uh, some commonality of, of data that's across those. Um, the, the power of this is not just that they're shared. Um, you know, it makes it easier for a client software or a service implementer to uh, implement more than one function, right? So if you're going to call, transfer, and transform, or repository for that matter, all the data types are the same so that you can uh, take the output of one function and provide it to the input of another function. That, that ability to uh, sort of take the modified data and move it down the line, uh, setting up like a chain or a pipeline, uh, means that you can build very complex workflows without having to have a lot of complexity uh, in the code. The code is very simple. It's the uh, the FINS model and the services doing the work to make this chaining uh, possible. Now, let me give an example of that uh, from a graphic point of view. Uh, is Let's say if we have a workflow where we have a, a content in a, in a repository. The content lives somewhere. Call that a repository. Now you want to extract some content. You want to move it someplace, maybe transcode it so they can be used uh, by a, a different uh, workflow part. Say, for example, you compress to a, a proxy resolution to make it uh, more easily streamable over a LAN. Uh, you also might want to move it uh, to different areas. Like, for example, here, uh, you have a, a nearline repository for short term archival. You want, may want to move your uh, material. To where the archival system can load it. So all these uh, different systems can be chained together where you take the output of the transfer and then you hand it to the transcode, take the output of the transcode, hand it to the transfer again, you take the output of transfer and then make that available to your uh, nearline repository. Uh, and that's a powerful model uh, to make you know, relatively uh, complex uh, workflows uh, simpler. So what are the services uh, that are defined at this point uh, in, in the FIM specification? Uh, there's Capture, which allows you to digitize or, or pull Essence in from a storage device or live signals, uh, say from a microwave relay or a satellite. Um, it will allow you to specify the, the range of that Essence. So if you're having a tape or, or a satellite feed, uh, you can specify how much of that signal you want to capture, uh, and then it allows you to specify uh, how you want it stored. Uh, 
what format you want it stored in and where do you want it stored. In. Transform is, is sort of a subset. It handles the, the conversion part of what we talked about before, where you can take essence files and uh, say, I want a version of this content in this format at this destination. Um, so uh, that allows you to do things like create proxy versions or to uh, bundle things up into a different container uh, that is acceptable by your say, your delivery system. And then transfer is the simplest service. Uh, it allows you to just move content from one storage location to another. Uh, and then there's a repository, and this is a little bit different because what this is really uh, about is less, um, you know, give me an input, I'll give you an output. This is really a, a, an interaction with an asset store. So it's like a front end uh, for a database where you can add content, you can query for content, you can extract content, uh, and uh, it gives you a sort of a common view to uh, a wide variety of asset stores through that common repository. So all this FIMS operations really depends, as was mentioned earlier, on common data that gets passed through all these different types. So uh, this is sort of a class diagram object model for FIMS data. Uh, I'm not going to get into the, uh, the exact details here, but you notice that the uh, lower left, you have the, what we mentioned before, it's profiles. We'll get into a little bit more what profiles are. Um, you have queues, uh, so services like transform, transform and transfer. Um, usually those are long-running jobs, and so there may be many more requests pending then the service can execute at one time because of resource constraints. So uh, services implement queues, and queues are where the job can be uh, stored uh, while it's pending. <coughs> and um, then when the job is active, it's, it's pulled off the queue and, and it's executed. Um, whether, a queue, uh, whether a transaction is queued or if it's active, it's represented as a job, and it's different flavors of jobs, different kinds of jobs transfer, transform, and capture. Um, jobs now also uh, contain the data that uh, it, it's the, the transaction, so it has to contain all the inputs and the output specifications. So that's why you have the profiles, that's the output specification, input specification, and all objects. Um, on the right side, you have some details about what's in a, a, the content. We'll get into all that. Uh, and then uh, that even goes down to the technical uh, details of uh, video and audio and data formats and all sorts of details. So let's start with some, some of the core uh, con uh, concepts in the data model. Uh, number one is resources. Um, this is used uh, both by the SOAP and the REST. I know resources is a main element of, uh, of a REST model, which is uh, uh, implemented for uh, thin services. Um, so what a resource it's, it's, a, it's an addressable element. It's an element with an identification and something you can specify in a URL or in, in another, in, in a parameter to a SOAP call. And so it's something you can retrieve. Uh, things in a thin service will have an identity. That's a, that's a resource. The kinds of things that have resources are jobs because a job is an object that's managed by a service. It, it has uh, an identification. Therefore, it's a resource. You can query for a job. You can submit a job, get a job. Queues, uh, assets, uh, descriptors, formats, profiles, these all uh, are resources. And their resources are identified by uh, some sort of ID. You can have a UUID, a simply UMID, or a simply universal label, uh, and, and also URL. So um, resource type, this is just details if you look in the schema. Um, there's a resource reference. There's a resource type that extends that reference, that ID with some optional fields, and the resource references are used to access data via the FIMS APIs. So now we will get into some of the, the lower level kinds of resources. The number one uh, root of all evil, so to speak, is the BM object. Uh, this is the, your core content uh, object, uh, and it's, it's what, what handles or what contains um, your your input and output um, uh, content references. So this is the main object for service transactions. Now, um, 
the, the schema allows for an object to contain a lot of different uh, elements of content. Um, and each one of those elements represents a single content ent entity, which is essence plus metadata. But the current specification is constrained a bit. Um, while the BMO can have a number or a collection of, of content objects, right now we only uh, deal with one. We only allow one. Um, future specifications may define how what it means to operate on a collection of objects because the semantics aren't quite defined yet. Uh, it's, it could just be a, a, an arbitrary set or just a multiplicity, or it could mean that these this is a grouping. And so it, it, there's future uh, work will define how that operates. Uh, as of today, business media object is equivalent uh, to uh, BM, a single BM content object. And what's BM content? Um, it really represents what's commonly called a clip. I call it a contiguous start to stop multimedia stream with video, audio, possibly uh, time-based uh, metadata, for example, closed captioning. Um, BM content can contain both um, descriptive metadata that's global to the entire content because it's, it's really the same vision, the same pictures, the same audio, um, but you can't have multiple essence formats. I have high res, I have proxy, I might have a, a QuickTime movie, an MXF Op 1A. So by allowing for a single content to have multiple instantiations, uh, that's what uh, the BM format is. Uh, so uh, content uh, all, for a single content must be in a uniform container format. And then also the metadata itself is derived from double core and new core specifications. So uh, we'll go through an example, uh, but the descriptive fields include things, uh, if you look at Dublin Core, title, creator, subject, um, things like that. Technical fields are organized by the specific um, format type, whether it be video, audio, or data. Uh, I can show a little bit of that. Here, um, this is the uh, repository uh, documentation set, um, and it's uh, generated from the uh, schema uh, document and here it shows uh, the definition of the content description. This is the descript this metadata, descriptive metadata for a BM content object. And it shows that you can have a number of titles, alternate titles, creators. These are the values that you can uh, add here. Um, but you can also extend it as well. So there's uh, things that you can do to add uh, your own metadata if you're a service provider. Or if your client, there's a way to look for extensions. So getting down to the format, um, as I mentioned, it represents an instance of contact, content, particular container with particular stream characteristics. And it has its own technical metadata because every format has different widths, heights, bit depths, compression types, uh, container formats, et cetera. And those are all derived from EBU, EBU core specifications and then organized by track. Um, the last part of the, this, this chain of, of the organization of the data model is the essence locator, which is, okay, I've described the content format, which is, you know, what container it's in, what, what the video and audio look like, where is it? And that's what the media essence locator does. It describes where the essence files are. Uh, and there's basically subtypes of that. So you can have a simple file locator subtype, which is a single quick time or MXF uh, container. Old locator, which is uh, sometimes when you have um, content that's that's organized like a DPX or camera volume, it's organized under a folder, um, or it could just be a list of individual files. This is where you have like different files for the video and audio, for example, in So let's look at um, sort of go back and kind of understand the, the big picture here of, of how uh, this works. So content has many has one or more, which is, has many formats, which could have many locations. You could have copies of that format in multiple different places, uh, depending on uh, what you're putting. Um, you have content, contains your editorial information, your user metadata, any uh, high-level identifiers. Content format is information about given instance of that, which is the video, compression, width, height, 
audio bit width, bit width, sample rate, things like that. And then the essence locator is where is this content that you've, uh, you've all lost. A little bit more detail here is you can see that uh, the kinds of information for content type, there's identifi identifiers. This is the descriptive below is descriptive metadata, um, description, creator, et cetera. Uh, and the format type, uh, it's video. Here's your codec, bit rate, audio encoding. And locator says, uh, you know, where is this uh, content? Uh, and uh, we can find, oh, yeah, here it is. It's on the storage uh, volume. Uh, the file name is uh, myfile.mp4. All right, before we go into here, one thing I want to look at is not this one. Here, here's a sample BM object uh, in XML format. Uh, and I just wanted to see what does this look like. Um, here we have a BM content object. Uh, if you look inside it, um, we start with the formats. So here's one format. Um, it's uh, a video. It's video. It has essence uh, in this myessence.mxf file that's at this URL. Uh, its video format is 1920 by 1080 with a specific frame rate. Uh, it's got an aspect ratio. It's all the technical information that's uh, important about that uh, video. Some audio information, sample size, bit rate. Um, container format is MXF. Um, and now you go into a second format. Um, here, the MIME type is image versus the previous format, which is video, which tells me this is a thumbnail. And so um, I have a JPEG file here that's my essence located, which me at this uh, my essence.jpg, JPEG. Um, I've got a display width for the image uh, and the size of it. And so now this is an alternate representation of the content if you want, for example, the, the thumbnail for that video. Um, and down below, you have your, your description. Uh, I have an extension group, which is, OK, I'm going to add my special identifier. And it's just a value here. This is uh, you know, one way to, uh, the way to extend this. But for cons uh, the standard uh, descriptive fields, here I've got uh, alternative title, creator, publisher, contributor, various values that um, users are going to be interested in either in display or in, in further workflow process. So that's a look at the uh, uh, an example of, of a VM object. So profiles are useful for the capture service, the transform service, and the transfer service. What they are are they sets of parameters that control the service functions. They really specify what the service is supposed to do. Now, each service request, each transaction can contain one or more profiles. That allows a single call to generate multiple outputs. I want to generate or I want to capture both high res and low res at the, at the same transaction. Instead of requiring me to capture high res and then downstream uh, translate, transform it into uh, a low res. Um, so profiles are made up of atoms. Now atoms are your, your exact parameter spec. Um, so you have different kinds of atoms for your transform function and your transfer function. And you have typically one transform atom and one or more transfer atoms because it's, it's frequently uh, useful. Like if you have a mirroring site or you just want to do edge serving or some other kind of caching, you might want to take a particular piece of content and make it available in more than one place. As a, as a picture of this, it's from the documentation. Uh, if you have a capture request, um, here we could have multiple capture profiles. Uh, each capture profile will have the transform atom, which says for this profile, which your video, audio, container formats, and where do I put them. Same for transform, exactly the same. You have transform profiles, which allow you to, to generate multiple transform outputs. At your distribution site, you might want to have your pad version, your phone version, your high-def high version, your Netflix version. All those can be specified in the different profiles. And then your transfer request, where your transfers uh, typically have uh, just the transfer part. The they transfer doesn't do any, any modification. All right, so, so those 
just covered sort of the, the, the core um, elements to you know, the kinds of data that you're going to pass around and, and how you uh, how you relate content to essence files and uh, metadata. Now we're going to go into the service side of things, what the different service categories and how services work. So uh, we have a couple of categories of um, how services are divided. One is job management. So for capture, transform, and transfer, tra transform and transfer, um, they work on a job basis. So you submit a request, the request gets uh, encapsulated in the job, and the job is queued until it can be processed. When it's, when it's done processing, the job is, is uh, then turned into a cleaned up state and it gets, it gets removed at some point. So there's functions to help you uh, interact with a service on the, on the topic of jobs. Tell me what jobs you have. We stop a job or cancel a job or you know, retry a job, things like that. So there's job management. Uh, the other one is functional. This is kind of the service entry points that do work. This is my capture request. This is my transform, my transfer, things that do work. Uh, for the repository, it would be create a, create a content object, uh, upload some essence, uh, delete something. So these are things that do work. And then there's administrative. This is where we can get uh, information about uh, services, uh, like what are your capabilities, or what are your restrictions, what can you do, what can't you do, and uh, information about state. What state are you in? Is there anything I need to know? So we, we different different categories are, are have different calling conventions. So um, what are the different calling conventions? There, there basically, there's, there's three ways of, of interacting with uh, a FIMS transaction. There's a synchronous call. This is the most simplest, uh, simplest kind. Uh, asynchronous calls, and then they have two uh, sub uh, conventions on that. One is you you get the you get an acknowledgement. Yes, I I've, I've got your request and I'm working on it. Um, and so you can either um, ask periodically. Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Or you can say, you know what? I'm going to let you know how to contact me for how uh, for when you're you have information that you're going to share with. Me. Um, but common to both synchronous and asynchronous is the idea that you can either have a successful result or you can have an error or a fault. Um, and those are uh, identified with codes. There's an extension for optional uh, text. So let's uh, go through the three times. Uh, we have a synchronous call. Um, this is, again, very basic. I have a, a request which has parameters, and I get a response back immediately. Um, if we look at the WSGO, so this is an example here for SOAP, right? So we have, in SOAP, you have operations. Um, so here, at least the fine. So let me look to the uh, right. So here I have a transfer, uh, say, immediate service status is a port. This is for doing the job and queue management. Um, I have a managed job operation. That's a function. And it has an input, which is its job request message. And it has an output or a fault. So the output, if, if you get an output, your message, uh, successful output, it's going to be a job response. If you get a fault back, you get a fault message. So going back to the diagram, here is where you get a successful response, and here is where you get a fault response. So one or the other is going to happen. And then you can just look at the message and find out if it's successful, what are your results? If it's a fault, why did it fail? This, this is the uh, scenario where you have asynchronous calls that you poll. So this is an example, say, for transfer. Um, I, I issue a request and I get an acknowledgement back. So we go back to the uh, wisdom here. Transfer media is the request. Scan that out. Operation transfer, it, it accepts a request message and gets back an acknowledgement. The acknowledgement contains all the information about the job, including its ID. And so you take that information from the acknowledgement and now you can use it to query for the, for the polling. So here, job ID that's handed into the, uh, the, the managed job, give me the status, 
um, that job ID is embedded in the uh, acknowledgement. And here you see the comment, get the job ID from the acknowledge message. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, for the notification side, this is one where part of the input being specified to the request is what's called an async endpoint. And that is a URL or set of URLs that you, 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 you're building a service implementation for that. So for SOAP, you build a SOAP endpoint. And you would say to the uh, service, send me a SOAP message at this URL when you either get a successful request, a successful response, or you have a fault. So you have a fault notification and you have a, a response notification. So um, that way the notification will just arrive when the when the information is ready. And the services read the client's responsibility is then to map the uh, the response, the, the notification, which contains the job identification, map that to the request so now that you know, oh yeah, this transfer I asked for. I got told it was successful or I got told it failed. And now I can take uh, appropriate action. So that's the asynchronous calls. With all so now with all this, it, you know, there is a, a diagram in the, uh, that's useful to know for cap this again for this, the capture, transform, and transfer services. Um, when you say what your, what your state is, here's the different states that a job can be in. Um, so they come in, they, they, they start with by being queued. queued. You can cancel out of the queue and go to the cancel state, or if it's running, you can cancel, it goes into the cancel state. So there's basically uh, ways that a job can tran transition from one state to the other, usually by an external influence, like the, the client issues uh, a function that uh, causes the state transition, cancel, uh, or pause or resume. Uh, or there's internal uh, influences, like when the job finishes, the job naturally converts from a running phase to a running state to a completed state. Um, or if a job fails, it will you know, go into, say, an unknown state or a failed state. So um, this is just to you know, go through that, that jobs can be in multiple states. There is a state diagram that service developers should be aware of uh, so that they make sure that they report states or they, they manage their state transitions consistently so that the clients can build their logic uh, consistently. If everybody has the same idea of what the states and transitions are, then workflows can be uniform, services can implement correctly, and uh, the system will work uh, optimally. Um, this is just uh, some a little bit more information on job management. Uh, that there's uh, four capture in transform transfer. We have query job uh, that finds uh, the jobs that are being processed by service. There's manage job, which allow for jobs to be controlled, states to be changed if possible. Uh, and then there's uh, manage queue, uh, which allows uh, service queue to be modified. That's things like um, the, cli uh, the client wants to tell, or an administrative user wants to tell a service, they stop taking jobs or, you know, uh, pause the jobs that you're doing and just, just relax. There's, there's a, a various uh, set of things. If we look at the documentation. I believe it's in the uh, base, base service descriptions. I won't go over it now, but uh, it's, if there's, if you look at the um, query, sorry, the manage queue request type, you'll see um, the various um, I don't even know where it was. And I, I, I apologize for the link here. So here's where you can look up the manage to request type, and it has a queue command. So we look for the queue command type.
And the queue command has values clear, clear the jobs in the queue, stop, stop the queue, which means that jobs can't move in or out of the queue. Uh, restart a job, stop the queue, which means resume service. Lock, locking a queue means that nothing can come in, but jobs can be processed that are already on the queue, like closing the, the uh, in-queuing uh, side of the queue. Uh, and unlock is just reversing the process to re-enable uh, in-queuing of jobs in the queue. So that is uh, queue management. And that's it. <laughs> We're at the end. And so um, for, for all other details, uh, there's some uh, good documentation, um, uh, both in the online documentation that uh, goes to the XSD and the WSDL. And, and here's where you can do things like look at the repository. Uh, what are the repository functions? Look here, and you see here are the, all the operations and, and what they do. All the documentation is in this, uh, in this, this set of web pages. So you, this is about uh, adding content, uh, adding essence, going through that. That's a specific, uh, the specific actions. Uh, the repository where you can get state um, capabilities, extensions, what you can update, what you can query, what you can search for. Uh, so there's that documentation, and then there is the um, published documentation, which uh, defines um, all the interfaces of the interface. And that's basically Okay, people, what do you think? Thumbs up. Um, I'm just worried. I, you know, I... I what happened here? I skipped a couple. Wow, this is weird because I hit next and it jumped right over my. I was, the reason I was a little surprised is I was waiting to get by the the repository thing because repository does have a little bit different handling of asynchronous calls and also has the RCR. And so I missed the, those two slides when I did the slideshow. Let me see. I hit next did you hide and it just jumped right to the end. I don't know. No, now it works. See, now I hit next and it goes correctly. But when I did it before, it jumped right past. So if you want, I can just, let me see. Let me see. Oh, wait. Oh, no. Share. Put the sharing back on. Uh, okay. So, yeah. So so here I was at job management. I hit next. And it jumped right to the end. and missed these last two slides. So um, let me just uh, continue. We can edit it in, I'm guessing. Okay. Uh, okay. So one of the things I want to uh, include here is that the repository service has a little bit different model of job management than the transfer, transform, capture services. Uh, there's no explicit queue to manage, and um, the, uh, there's no way to query for jobs. But what, what happens is when you get an acknowledgment that, you get, of course, the job information just like with the others. But now you can issue a direct request um, to the repository for that job. So you can say, uh, here's a job ID, please cancel it. Um, and if we go back to the uh, documentation for the functions, and we go to the repository functions, um, example is, of that is, um, let's pull one up, cancel, cancel, cancel. Where did the cancel go? Oh, here it is. Here's one. So uh, when we do a purge, a purge is a long-running uh, function, and here's the cancel, which takes as its input a request message. And if we look at that and what that contains, um, Here we go. Let's type. And it has here the operation ID, which is returned from the acknowledgement. I want to start that again. Okay. So just just going to run. Yeah. Yeah. Number two. Real quickly before you do that, can you, yeah. make, can you make the text bigger 
in the uh, when you're showing the yes uh, yeah, cause we can't see it okay we'll do uh, I thought I could do I'm hitting the well, plus 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 uh, oh it's just slow okay it's getting bigger Okay, so, okay. Good now. Info add. All right. Okay. So let me go back. Okay. So one thing that's different about the repository service compared to the transfer, transform, and attachment services, there's a slightly different model for job management. Uh, the major difference is that there's no explicit queue to manage. There's no queue management functions that are available. And there's no um, managed job that has the same uh, semantics or same operation. So instead, what, what can happen is the only thing you can do is effectively cancel a request. So, for example, add essence where you, you're uploading a potentially very large essence file into a repository. Um, that job uh, may get queued up. It may not be getting processed or it may be the wrong request. In any case, it may be necessary to cancel it. So, um, the client can issue a cancel add essence um, request. Uh, and we look at the documentation here. Um, the request type, this is the message that you send has uh, the operation ID, which is equivalent in the other cases to the job ID. Uh, this is an identifier for the, uh, the uh, asynchronous request. And so this is what's being canceled. So it, it's a little bit different. Um, uh, and then everything is really delivered through the notification. Uh, so there is no polling equivalent as there is in capture transfer. Um, finally, the uh, repository service capabilities. Um, the FIMS repository, as, as mentioned, provides information on sort of the scope of the implementation and also the status of what the service, uh, how, what state the service is in while it's running. Uh, so it includes uh, supported operations and features, supported metadata fields, queryable or searchable metadata, uh, and performance and resource indicators to give you an idea of uh, you know, is is the is this space rolling out? Uh, is it is it heavily loaded? Is there a reason maybe why uh, a job might be taking a long time, et cetera? And for the repository, this is information which is stored in the repository capabilities registry interface or RCI. And so, if we go back to the documentation, and we go down to look at the RCI. Here are the supported uh, functions you can see in the documentation. Get the state, get available storage, um, performance indicators. Um, you can get the general capabilities, which are uh, the level of implementation, you know, what, what things are supported, what fields are supported, you know, timeouts, uh, what events uh, are, will be delivered, um, schema extensions, what properties you can update, what you can query, um, you know, getting locks. This will all be described in specific detail when this API is, is discussed in a, in a subsequent uh, different uh, implementing guideline. And that's the end of the presentation.